Hello, everyone, and welcome back to La Cancha. Happy New Year, everyone. It's 2023. We've been gone for a while after the World Cup, but I'm glad to have Oscar here to continue regular schedule programming. We're going to talk about all the beautiful things about La Liga and Mateo Lajos. Um, but first, we're going to start in the controversial derby, which was the Barcelona derby. And this derby started with a lot of controversy after what happened with Robin Lewandowski. Lewandowski, if you remember, to take our memories back, he got a two yellow cards, a red card against Osuna. Um, the REFEF added two extra red, two extra games of suspension. Uh, Barcelona tried to take it to TAD, which is the um, sports administrative court. They were successful, and we thought, okay, that was the story. That was it. It was dead and buried. Lewandowski was not going to play against Espanyol, against Atletico, against Getafe. But then Barcelona, being as uh, judicious as they are, <laughs> went <laughs> to the contentious courts of Madrid and decided that and the court decided that Barcelona was going to have a stay of execution while they decided whether the crime was worth it or not, whether the three match punishments was was excessive or not. And so that meant that Robert Lewandowski did play this game. And that was the controversy coming into this. Espanyol were obviously upset. Um, Oscar, what do you think about this? Like, first of all, let's start with the suspension in itself. Do you think it was worth the three match suspension because I think we didn't really touch into that when we covered mm-hmm. this game. Yeah, I mean, I believe he should get one game for obviously committing two yellow card fouls. That day, if you remember, I was pissed with the referee of that game too because he was just inconsistent with the yellow cards and everything. I felt his first wasn't a yellow, but that's by the by. The two game ban for the gesture, um, I don't necessarily agree with it because he wasn't... Uh, well, call me biased, but I believe Spanish referees are too sensitive. So, in any case, I feel like even if they're like going through the judicial loopholes and everything, that he should have still been suspended for this game, not the Atleti... Um, I, I think in the end, he'll probably get a one-game suspension for the yellow card, which... You know, at the end of the day, I feel like doing all this is kind of unnecessary. Like, we could just manage for three games. Yeah. Now we have the uncertainty of, oh, if he's guilty, we can miss him for three important games. Maybe, who knows, a classical, a Europa... Oh, sorry, why am I saying Europa League? I'm tripping. <laughs> yeah, but a classical or something. So, yeah, it's not really an ideal situation for anybody because even Javi, Javi was, like, saying... He had plans for what he was going to do with this game without Lewandowski and then a day before he's told you can't have Lewandowski and then it's just disruptive around for everyone, especially yeah. Espanol. Yeah, yeah. And and the thing is like I I think in that first conference Shabby blamed the organization, yeah. but I don't think it's a problem of organization because the REFEF told him no. Tad already told Barcelona no. This is a Barcelona issue and I wonder the I don't know the judgments call from Barcelona to, in this game because Barcelona historically they've always beaten Espanyol at home, so it's not like a game where you really need Robert Lewandowski. It's not like you're playing Real Madrid or Atletico or Real Sociedad who are on great form. So, like, it made no sense to me. And I think you've mentioned about the fact that games that Lewandowski could miss if the ban is finalized. But also mm-hmm. Espanyol this morning they've also made a complaint that. Lewandowski was illegally aligned, which could mean that Barcelona could lose all three points in this. So that's another thing that could happen. Yeah, but then he, their newest complaint, I don't really get why they're doing it because the league have themselves have come out and said, or well, not come out, but they've said, our hands are tied. This is something from the courts. So it's just a case where Barcelona's insistence means that Espanyol were screwed over. So sure. there's nothing the league can really do about it. They were, they were told he can play the game and they have to argue with the courts. Yeah. So now let's let's move on from all this off the field shenanigans. Let's talk about the real game because whether Lewandowski played or didn't play, it didn't really matter because like 
he missed a lot of chances. And, and I felt Barcelona, they started this game really well. A lot mm-hmm. of the chances came from crosses into the box, which just finally didn't really do well. But Lewandowski seemed to be missing that finishing edge that you usually associate with him. Yeah. I mean, I'm not here to make excuses for him or the team because we... We should have kept up the intensity of the first 30 minutes for the whole of the game because we just, and I kind of felt that this was going to come, we just, after 30 minutes, said, okay, we're okay with 1-0 and just slow the tempo down, the tempo down, allow the Espanyol to, you know, stay alive and just get the off chance of a penalty or something, which happened. But in Lewandowski's case, I can excuse me a bit because he didn't think he was playing tomorrow. So, yeah. The normal preparation, like the normal way you keep yourself in shape and everything, or, or might not have been there. Still, you'd expect him to finish some of the chances he got. You'd have expected us to, at the very least, maintain a high tempo 90 minute game like we did before the World Cup break. So, yeah, the blame for the draw is ultimately on our inability to, or rather, refusal to just. You know, keep the tempo of the game up and make ourselves unplayable from an Espanyol perspective. Yeah, and one player that was on form for that game was Soselu, who stepped up. He got the penalty, he stepped up, and he converted the penalty. Any questions regarding the penalty? No, no. I think yeah. while Marcos Alonso wasn't looking to trip him, it's one of those where, you know, he just gave it because... Yeah. The trip obviously impedes Osalu's ability to get on the end of the ball. Or yeah. whatever. It's it's an unfortunate penalty because like it, yeah, Osalu was was going nowhere. <laughs> it's, it's it sucks, but again, we caused this to happen. We allowed external factors to take the game away from us when we had the ability to eliminate any external nonsense like someone we're going to discuss because he <laughs> wants to be the talk of the town. Yeah, yeah. Let, let's talk about Senor Lajos because, like, in the World Cup, in the game against Argentina and Netherlands, he was the main it was the main protagonist. And in this game, after this game, As described it as the Matteo Lajos show. After that penalty, just, like, the game went haywire. It was, it was a clown show. Even before the penalty, like... Some of the a lot you would look at this game and think it was a dirty game when it wasn't. Like some of the yellow cards were for silly stuff. Some challenges, like the bar for a yellow card was all over the place. <laughs> it was frustrating. He didn't like yes, he sent off um Vinicius Vinicioza, but Cabrera should have seen a second yellow at the very least. Yeah. This guy um, Puado almost ends Dembele's career with a scissor tackle and oh, not. That was a red. That was a red. That, that's a red and a match ban. That's honestly, yeah. like Dembele is lucky he didn't catch him. And you know Dembele, while he has overcome that problem of injuries, yeah, he's you know his history. Like yeah, it, it's and then one, it's one of those things that's a direct red card, the Puado tackle, because it recklessly endangers an opponent. Mm-hmm, exactly, and that shouldn't happen. Mm-hmm. The thing and that, that, oh, sorry. Another thing. You have Jordi Alba getting sent off for two decent yellow cards. And apparently, according to Sergio Roberto, no one even knew that he booked Alba in the first place. So, yeah. I mean, for someone who likes talking to players, you think he'd make it clear that I've booked you once, if that's true, by the way. No, no. I, I, honestly, I think that's a bit of a fit from Sergio Roberto because if you see the replay you see that he does book Alba and does book Benitez I know, uh, that, that's why I was like if yeah. it's true yeah and, and I feel in that case I think it's Alba's fault for the first yellow card because there was nothing you should have done like Alba is the kind of player who is always looking for trouble and Espanol players are celebrating and stuff like you're Barcelona you have the players to make this I know they just got a 1-1 you have players to make it 4-1 before the game's over so I know right yeah, and with the Vinnies, this was a yellow card. I, I felt that was the softest yellow card, second yellow you could give. Because I think Sergio Roberto, like, he allows himself to fall down. But given how the situation had been, he already said to Alba, mm-hmm. yeah, at the Camp Nou, it, would have, it wouldn't have made sense for him to give, to let Vinny de Souza go away. But yeah. the Cabrera one, like, 
least he should be off because I think he did a better pressure. Yeah, he has the thing, and he has the frustration I have with the with VAR. Like they make VAR so complicated to understand. Like oh, we can only check for direct red cards, not second. Like because if if he does not go to VAR at all and he gives a second yellow, he's still off. Yeah, he decides to give a straight red, which is still fair. But then because of the letter of the law. He has changed that from his. He changes that from his straight red to not. It doesn't make any sense, no, but still. But even if, like, if you look at that and you're like, mm-hmm. okay, it's not a straight red, can you mm-hmm. come back and give a yellow card because you're like, I think you've done something sneaky here. Exactly, but for some reason, whether he chose to not give him the yellow or because of the law, he didn't give him the yellow. Yeah. And here we have it: a game that was just about one guy. Yeah, but but to be fair, fair play for Espanol. They grabbed their first point at Camp Nou since 2009, I believe. So it's fair play to them. And that means that Real Madrid are leveling points with Barcelona. And Real Madrid, they had to struggle against Real Valladolid, who gave all they could get. Um, I want to talk about, first of all, before we get into the controversy, I'm going to talk about Fresneda because um, he's a guy mm-hmm. I didn't really know too much about. But um, over... December over the Christmas break, I'd seen him linked with everyone and their mother. Everyone and their mother thinks he's the next best thing as a right back. It really impressed me in this game. He was really good against Vinny Jr. He really shut him out of that game. Uh, like, in a way, I haven't seen any player shut him out. And what do you think of his performance and what do you think of Real Valladolid the lead in general? Yeah, at first night, that was really good in this game. He's someone that's coming to the team this season and has done well. I remember him. In the three two win against Atafe earlier this year, he was absolutely great. And yeah, he has a bright future ahead of him. I'm seeing people like talking him and are now up to be next big teams at right back for Spain. So yeah, um, good luck to them and that. As for Relva, the lead, yeah, they played well, like Pacheta played his cards well, but the team with Real Madrid and we know the script inside and out. By now, yeah, I already knew what was going to happen. Everyone that was watching this game with knew what was going to happen. They will somehow win the <laughs> game, even if they're not playing well. Yeah. It's just that the win came in the most infuriating way possible. <laughs> yeah, like like if you're neutral or you're not so supposed to remember, you're we're quite pissed off. But let's talk about all the controversial decisions. Uh, first of all, the first penalty shot from Real Madrid. I don't mm-hmm. think that's a penalty. I know the image makes it look like a penalty because mm-hmm. you can see it touching his arm. Mm-hmm. But according to the rules of the law, if it touches your body and you're trying to support yourself, then it touches your arm, then that's not a penalty. So I think the referee gets that right. Yeah, yeah it was a case of like, you know, like he did touch his body first. I think that's what helps him. If it didn't touch his body at all and went straight to the arm, yeah. again, I'm still like, that's probably not... A penalty because he's trying to support himself, but I can see that being given. So luckily for him, yeah. it touched his body first. Yeah. But I can see obviously when people just share still images, I can see why people will say it's a penalty. Like, yeah, yeah, it's, it's that, that's something I really dislike about like football discourse. It's like you see the still images and you're like, oh, that's a definite penalty. But when, mm-hmm. when you look at a gift or something, you see it like much clearer. And we'll, we'll move on to Ram just penalty. And what pisses me off about this penalty is not the penalty itself this game. Although I do think it's a harsh penalty because the defender is not looking at, like, he's not looking at the ball. His arm is in a fairly mm-hmm. natural position for someone who would have made a jump for the ball. Find the rest gets a penalty. Sergio Leon is absolutely going ballistic in the touchline. But this is a guy who's about to go off, mm-hmm. right? And this is where I feel in Spain. And this is one of the things that really, really annoys me about Spanish football. As you mentioned earlier, the referees, they need to learn how to be better at emotional management of the players because mm-hmm. they, they're too card hungry. Because in that situation, you could have just gone to the jury and given them a yellow card and you can like, no more of this, no more of this. Like, I've already made my decision and go. But the referee, to give a straight red straight after that, like, that's how you integrate the public in, and you integrate most of the like you for most of the audience who are watching this as neutrals. So mm-hmm. fairly, I felt this was a fairly good game. It was a fairly competitive game. If Real Madrid had won, you don't know because like maybe 
um, Weissman would have come on and he would have made a difference, although Couture was amazing. But it's things like this that really take the joy out of the game. And I feel that's something referees have been doing too much this season in that their emotional intelligence for managing games is lacking severely. The overall intelligence is lacking severely. <laughs> <laughs> no, honestly, I was so mad between this one and what Lahoz was cooking up the next day. I was like, this league is done for with these two referees of this stuff because it's like people that don't watch the league would think like players punch each other for fun when no. Yeah. A lot of these sending offs are because these referees cannot, like, they're too sensitive. No, like, extremely. There, there are about seven or eight red cards this match day. And I don't think, apart from the Poado tackle, which was... Not uh, even... Not a really yeah. card, I don't think I saw any really, really dangerous tackle that I would consider, like, this guy deserves a straight red. Mm-hmm. And it, it's just, it just really annoys me. But you know what? You have to give Real Madrid credit for what they've done. Mm-hmm. They score two late goals. They're level on points at Barca right now. And uh, it does seem like we're going to have an interesting title race between both teams. Yeah, it's also frustrating that we didn't, you know, win <laughs> to. But, and we have a tough game against Atlético at the weekend. Yeah. But well, not... yeah, last time we went to Madrid and we were level at the top of the table, we lost 3 <laughs> 1. Hopefully it doesn't happen because if Atletico beat us, I'll bury my head under the sand. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but we're not going to talk about Atletico at the moment because we're going to talk about Real Sociedad. And I've been really enjoying them this season. Like in the past two years, they've been sort of sour, sort of dry to watch. But my God, when you look at them play with and Kubo's combining with Silva, combining with Bryce, with Marino, with Zubimendi, and you're like, this team, we're, we've slept on them as a potential top four candidate. But every time I watch them play, I just feel like maybe they might be the ones to get it. And Bryce Mendes, he's been on fire this year. Yeah, the best 14 million anyone has spent in Europe this season. Yeah, he's really set the league alight. He's possibly a top five player in this league this season. Like we're seeing here, he has 10 goal involvement, 7 goals, 3 assists. In the Europa League, he's taking some big goals for them too, as lets them, you know, qualifying first in their group. But yeah, it's just, he's fun to watch. Like, his goal was really taken well, if you've seen it. I'm real so sad that a whole are really fun. You mentioned Kubo Son, who has struggled for consistency in different seasons, but now he's feel, he's like in the right environment to really show what he can do. And the new good news gets better for Real Sociedad because their main player is back. Yeah, yeah, and that's something you we forget about Real Sociedad mm-hmm. is that the injuries they've dealt with in the last mm-hmm. two, three, two and a half seasons, like they've been missing Cho, Oyakabal, Sadiq, you must forget, Sadiq was the big money signing, and he's mm-hmm. been missing so far, and they're still here, yeah, like top top three. And you just yeah. imagine if they had these players, what they could do. Yeah, it's going to be really interesting to see how uh, Fabel fits into this new four four two diamond that they're kind of doing, or if he goes back to a standard three four four three three because I can understand changing the formation to include more central midfield as if all of your forwards are injured. I hope they stick with this though, because at least on FIFA, it looks good. Yeah. <laughs> In real life, it might be good too. Yeah, and I'm, and I'm super excited to see Cho because he scored that, he scored a goal in the Copa del Rey. I was like, this guy has some quality. And I, you just you just forget, they have, they're a very slept on team because they have so many good players. Um, maybe they're unlucky because Sorloff is there and Sorloff sometimes he looks like he's the real deal and other times he's missing sitters. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But, yeah. But I, I think we expect to see more from them. Also, Suna, they haven't beaten Real Sociedad in a while, but the thing for them that we have to talk about is Roberto mm-hmm. Torres, who is leaving us Suna, and he's such a legend for them. So I just wanted to mention that. Yeah. He's spent 16 years at the club, I believe. You know, this season... The first half, he hasn't really featured much because Osasuna have been doing really well too. I mean, losing your last two games to Barca and Real Sociedad is nothing to be ashamed of. Yeah. But yeah, I, I feel he feels and the club feels like, you know, now is the right time to probably go. 
But, you know, if they make Europe somehow, you might be feeling bad for leaving early. <laughs> yeah, it might be. And I think they're four points behind Atletico Madrid, which is something that, who knows, maybe they might be the Champions League. And Atletico, I, they, they disappointed me a bit in the first half because they're playing against Elche. I, I get the fact that the World Cup guys are not there, apart from Griezmann. And Elche, they're bottom of the table. They have four points. And you would have expected this is a game where I know they haven't been on good form, but this is a good home banker for them to put two or three um, in there. But they, had to, they really struggled. And until the game was 10, 10 v 10, Atletico didn't really show their true power. Yeah, the first half was a bit of a drag. You know, Elche in their first match on their a machine, you know, they clearly set up to defend and just, you know, get a point if necessary. Uh, Atleti just had no ideas to break them down. There were like some combinations they tried, but they didn't really work. And like you said, it took 10 men for more space to appear, I guess. And, you know, Griezmann showed his importance. You know, he's important for his country. He's been very important for his club this season. Felix is in good form if you're looking at club form. Yeah. And then Morata, you know, gets in on the goals too. So a good win for them. Yeah, I got the win. Did you see Marissa's reaction after he scored? I don't remember the reaction. I just remember the goal. It was just, it was just a funny goal. Yeah. Yes, I think Morata, he goes down on the field and then he realized that there's a goal. So he goes to celebrate with like Griezmann and stuff and it's like, he thinks Griezmann is the one that scored. And then after that, Griezmann is like, you scored. And it's like, me? I scored? <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. I, I don't remember that. Yeah. Yeah, it was it was a really good goal. I mean if if it wasn't deflected and looped in like that, I'm sure that would have been a goal we're talking about in a very high regard. Yeah, a very high regard. Griezmann has been in good form. His hairstyle a bit. I, I felt my computer was having a virus when I saw his hair. <laughs> Yeah, I, I, I don't. I don't know about the change of hair. <laughs> yeah, but but let's talk about Joe Felix though, because he's the one who's like his future is uncertain. Um, Atletico Madrid, they, it seems like they are willing to sell him in the winter window. Do you think it's a good idea to sell him now, or should they wait till the summer to sell him? It depends on the offer. I feel like if someone is willing to pay hundred and something for him now, take it. Yeah. If you know, because by the summer his value may drop, it may ri- it may rise. Like that's probably the better time to sell him. But yeah, there's there also there's always the uncertainty that Felix himself brings. Well, okay, it seems like in these last five games for Atleti, he's in a good purple patch. We've seen that before. Yeah. Can he be consistent? We'll yeah. see. And and thing about Felix though is like he's yes he has scored goals in this last three games but you look at the location of where those teams are on the table mm-hmm. they're like sixteen seventeen twenty so I, I just I just question whether it's about him or it's about the possible position is facing right and I know I might be themed as a John Felix later but. I, I just wonder whether he has that against like the better teams in La Liga to really have a performance where he stamps his authority. And I think that's something, if he leaves Athletic Madrid this winter, that's something his career at Athletic Madrid has missed. Like that big game performance against in the Madrid Derby or against Barca or against Sevilla, like he's, he lacks that somewhat. Well, let's hope he continues that this weekend. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, let's hope he does. And I think chasing Atleti is Betis. No, I, I have to clarify. I hope he continues not performing. Not performing. Against us. Yeah. <laughs> I don't want him to go and score a hat trick against us or something. Yeah, I mean, maybe he scores the hat trick and then his value maybe. goes up and he's like, because like right now, maybe maybe the reason why he's playing well is because like I'm in the market. So if I play well and I score his goals, I can get more offers for myself and I can True. get out of this situation. Shall we'll we move on to Betis? Yeah. Yeah. What do you think about this? Because I really enjoyed this game. It was a 0 0, and I felt it was like it's one of those things where um, I didn't think it was a violent game. Um, Luis Felipe had a brilliant game. Luis Enrique, for the way, for knowing what happened to his dad, because mm-hmm. he obviously lost his father, the way he played was incredible. The maturity he showed, 
Like I feel mm-hmm. gave his best performance. But I really like this because both teams they both went for the win. They both went at each other at times, like one at the upper end. But they finished zero zero. What do you think about Luis Felipe's performance? Yeah, uh, Luis Felipe was probably one of the chief reasons why Athletic Club didn't get on the score sheet. He was absolutely immense at the back, and he had to be because his centre back partner Felix, you know, the, this is his debut, and I thought he also played well too. But Felipe, you know, really carried the defense, you know, made good interceptions, blocks, and was just a leader there. It's just a shame that he ruined it with a red card at the end. Yeah, so both teams, they're, I believe they're tied on 25 points. With Betis, the discipline record that they have, I think they have eight red cards so far this season. That's yeah. almost a red card every two games. Is this going to cost them in the in the final analysis when we're discussing at the end of the season why they didn't reach the Champions League spots? At this point, you think so because... It's definitely caused them already this season because if you remember the Celta game where they lost 1 0, but Celta were terrible, and even with 10 men, Real Betis while playing them. Imagine that with 11 men. Like, you know, that's a game they could have gotten three points, they'd be fourth right now. Yeah. Against Real Valladolid, same thing. You draw that game. Against if they Sevilla. keep 11 men on the Sevilla too, they're initially a man up and then they become a man down. Yeah, so it's just that this player record is just crazy at this point. So yeah. for their sake they'd hope they should hope that they, you know, arrest that. Yeah, and Athletic, um, they've not been so good against the top teams. They've been good against teams that they should be, but against the top teams they really struggle. Mm, yeah. So far, yeah, they've lost to Atleti, Barca and they drew it severe, although I don't know if you can call them a top team. Now. <laughs> <laughs> they, they've drawn with Betis. They they drew it Villarreal too, right? No, no, I think they beat Villarreal. Villarreal is the one that they, they did beat. Yeah, they did beat Villarreal. So it's a bit mixed. And they don't look as sharp as they did at the start of the scene, but they're still in a very good position. It's just all about, you know, taking advantage of whoever slips in this top four race because the last games before the break, remember only two teams in the top eight or three teams in the top eight won their game. So it's all about taking advantage of others. Yeah, it's all about that. And with Betis, they still have to play Barca, the, the Bass Derby soon. So that should be fun. Um, speaking of derbies, Villarreal played against Valencia and the derby, the community derby, and this was the Reals, the they reformed Ceramica. What do you think about it? It looked really nice. It looked really cute. Yeah, opinion. it looks really great. And you know, to have a derby there and to win it, you know, it's just something that will live long in the memory. I, I do think this is something that's better the Real, The fact that they haven't played at home since the start of the season, it's December thirty first, and that's their first real mm-hmm. home game. Well. In some ways, you could say that, but then when you, because we watch them every week, and then when you look at the way they've lost some games, they've probably lost games that same way for the last two years. So, <laughs> you know, I don't think it's. I, I think that this will definitely give them a boost, especially beating Valencia in this manner, scoring a late goal. So, yeah, it will definitely help them be stronger from now to the end of the season. Yeah. For sure, for sure. But this game, it started, it started like it was going to be another, another tragedy for Setien because Gerard misses a chance that you mm-hmm. do not associate with Gerard at all. Like, he was already going away celebrating. Well, <laughs> I thought that was a goal. And... This season, he's kind of missed it quite a few big chances. So yeah. It's something he probably needs to cut out of his game at this point. Yeah. And, and do you know Cavani's record with Valencia? Yeah, he, has, he scored five goals. But every, I don't know. Every, in how, I don't know the number of games yet. Every time Cavani has scored, Valencia have not gotten a win. That's crazy. <laughs> really? Yeah. And it's simple. Don't play Cavani. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but when 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 you can score a goal like that, that's like that's why you play Cavani. And yeah. And to be fair, I feel I feel this was 
it was a very entertaining derby in the fact that the teams had they were similar but they were super direct um from what i saw from setien i felt he's gotten his points across with the players because they were making a lot of good runs it wasn't just possession for possession sake and mm -hmm. Etienne Kapoe, man, he didn't get on score sheet, but that guy is such a demon in the midfield, the way he shoots, the way he's the engine of that team, and they look like they're starting to become more and more of a Setien team at the moment. Yeah, definitely. That World Cup break, if there was a... Villarreal were definitely one of the teams that needed that break more, and given that only a few of their players went to the World Cup, he's probably gotten his Point across to the likes of Gerard and Juma, you know, guys that weren't fit. Yeah. To and I feel like if those guys are fit, that's obviously going to propel Villarreal back into the top four conversation. Yeah, and he's played with a four three three in this game. Uh, he's played with Samu Chikwe, so he seems like he has more protagonism now that Unai Emery has left. I don't think Unai Emery really rated him, Chikwe, but he seems that he has protagonism. He scored a goal in the derby. And he was voted man of the match. And what do you think of his performance in general? Yeah, I thought it was very good. I feel like this 4 3 3 formation gives um, both him and Pino more protagonism because I've noticed Pino's actions during games have increased since um, Emery left. I feel because Emery is more of a cautious manager by nature, so he tells his wingers to really support their fullbacks. But in the shape, in the current shape that Villarreal are playing, they don't necessarily have to do that as much. So I feel we'll see better things from them. Yeah, we'll, we will see. And it only gets harder for Villarreal because the next up is Real Madrid. Uh, for Valencia, though, I feel, I feel I feel they were. It was a bit hard done by to lose the derby that way. But um, I do think Villarreal were the better team, if I'm being honest. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, let's move on to Girona versus Rayo. And Rayo, they have this incredible record in Catalonia. We felt that that was about to come to an end, but controversial bar decision. This game started off La Liga after the long break, and I thought it was a super interesting game. Um, Cameo scores early. EC Palasson scores. Girona get two penalties. Um, I, on either side of the goal, like, really, really brilliant game of football. Yeah, it was you know it was a great way to get back into things, like because these are two teams that are really good at you know playing nice football, especially Rayo with Girona, they usually don't get the results they deserve, and you can argue in this game in the second half they were much better than oh, Rayo, yeah, they were, and they were robbed of a winner because the referees don't know how to do their job. <laughs> yeah, that, that's the theme. It's, it's annoying that every single podcast we have to talk about referees. But yeah, you're right. Girona, they really bossed the game. They were really on top. I feel Rayo, they didn't play to their best at, at this point. So I, I think Girona, they can count themselves unlucky for this. Um, they got knocked out of the Copa del Rey earlier, but they would have time to prepare for their next game. For Rayo, though, this is the last game before the introduction of Raul de Tomas. So I'm, I'm super excited for that. We'll see what happens when he comes back. Mm -hmm. And how, how do you think he does he mess up the like the way this team functions? Because it seems right now that Cameo is finally finding his feet in as the main striker for Rayo. But if de Tomas comes in, where does he play? Yeah, the thing is that given how Raul de Tomas plays, he's more of a selfish kind of striker as against Kameo who is really associative and he has grown in every game I've seen him play this season so it might affect him dynamic for a bit but then the personally if you look at the two strikers one of them is clearly better than the other so yeah you know that might like there are chances that Kameo might not be able to finish now that the Thomas will certainly finish yeah. But I don't think he plays right away. I feel like he gets eased into the team because he's not played for a few months now. So yeah, for close he's to not going to be much fit. Months. Yeah, and if Cameo keeps playing well and Falcao, we also have to talk about him. He's when he's come off the bench or when he's played, he's done some good things too. So that's a really good strike force they have there. <laughs> yeah, they have, they have a galactic strike force there. Mm -hmm. And Rayo, let's not forget, they're about a point away from Europe. They're four points away from the Champions League, so it's very, very congested that between 
ninth and third at the moment. So, but the speak on Katafe, I felt they they really played really good football in this game. They were a joy to watch. They um, they outplayed Mallorca, and I, I was I was thinking on another podcast, and I was like, I was thinking Mallorca. They were one of the teams that I felt the break might not have done them super well because they were in such good form before that break. Mm-hmm. And it's just when it come when it came back from this, it was like watching a different team. They were super passive. Etape created lots of chances, and Etape on our team that are used to creating that many chances. Yeah. Um, yeah, I felt like the main factor behind Hatafe's great game was Alenia. He played one of the best games I've seen him play in a while. And in general, this season, he's had a good year. You know, um, and his null is obviously very important and obviously does lots of good things in terms of creating assists for his strike partner, Boya Mayoral. You know, you have Algobia, who's, you know, since he came into the Getafe team this season, they've been better when he's on the pitch. Yeah, it's a really positive sign for Getafe that they're, you know, playing football again and not, you know, <laughs> trying to fight with everybody. Yeah, I feel the days of, like, teams like that, it's, like, somewhat gone. Like, the only team I think is like that is, like, Cadiz. Yeah, but even then, Cad just haven't had the chance to do that because they're usually chasing games. <laughs> yeah. yeah, they're usually chasing games. Like, what happened against Almeria? And I, I felt this was a big misopportunity for Almeria because Almeria, they really dominated this game. They had mm-hmm. lots of chances. They were creating chance after chance after chance. And so those things where it's like a FIFA script, right? You're creating all yeah. these opportunities. And you know, like, if in the last minute, if you don't score this, computer is going to score against you. And then Lucas came in and he saved the point for Cadiz. And Almeria is still without a, a win away from home. Yeah. Like once I saw Bill Alture hit the post when they were 1 0 up, I knew, okay, these guys aren't getting this win. <laughs> Cadiz will somehow find a way. And, you know, Lucas Perez left them a, a, a potentially important parting gift. Yeah. Do you think he's going to go to Deportivo? He's already gone. He's gone. Oh, nice. Yeah, I'm sorry. To open. Where have you been? <laughs> no, because no, no, I've been I've been hearing things because like I have been reading and like oh Deportivo might have might rescind yeah. this and stuff. But wow, yeah. oh, it's gone. Yeah, yeah he, he was confirmed before the New Year's actually. Oh wow, that's damn, and that's that's really that's a strange move for him to go all the way to the Premier Ref. Yeah, but you know, he's looking at his beloved Deportivo and he's tired of watching us, you know, play like idiots and bottle promotion chances. <laughs> yeah, and you know what he even did? He even paid out of pocket too to make the move possible. Uh, that, uh, this is kind of like a Javi coming back to Barca kind of thing where, you know, you just have to help your beloved club. Yeah, that would be a big miss for Cadet, very big. But like yeah. replacing him might be Canadian Kyle Lauren, who I think I think might be a side for a fans in Canada. So, um, but with Cadet, do you see the first goal that was disallowed by uh, the Brian on Campbell goal? Yeah, I was praying that that goal didn't get disallowed because I was like, this is the type of goal you don't want disallowed. <laughs> yeah, it was a good goal, and I think that would have been his first goal for Cadet, and it's good. I don't want this for the guy because I'm someone that likes Brian Campbell a lot so. Yeah, it was kind of annoying to see that go chopped off, but hey, what can you do sometimes? And about Cadet, what do you think about their chances of survival? I'm just quickly look at the other table again. <laughs> it's getting crowded down there. Okay. Yeah. I'm going to give Sevilla and Celta the benefit of doubt for now. So that leaves Real Valladolid, Espanyol, and Cadiz fighting for trip. Again, even. It's a strange season, man. I don't know. Yeah, it's a Because they expect Espanyol to be better than what they've shown so far. I mean, on Cardiff need huge signings because whoever comes in needs to be able to impact them the way Lucas Perez has been impacting them. And I also wasn't even understanding why Lucas Perez didn't start games because he's clearly their best striker. I think yeah. I think it's because in the summer he wanted that move to Deputy. Still, I mean, still. I mean, you you like a beggar isn't going to reject free food. <laughs> like I don't I, I don't get I understand um Espanol 
pushing Raul de Tomas out the door to an extent because you think that they'd have a good cover for him and they signed Rosero, but card is you don't have anyone besides him. Like Negredo is not the same guy. Yeah. Lozano is not really good. And I'm not even going to talk about Sabrina. <laughs> so, yeah. 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 It's, 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 it's been like, if you can sum up the season, the main um, antagonist for a lot of these teams have been the sporting directors or the presidents, yeah. which I feel yeah. they've gotten it so wrong in so many clubs. Yeah. Um, especially with Celta and Sevilla. Celta, to an extent, you can see the project. Like like we said at the beginning of the podcast mm-hmm. or the beginning of season, the Celta project is something that could either go really badly or really well because they've made so many changes, so many mm-hmm. changes that I thought were exciting changes. Um, it didn't work with Chacha Code. They brought in uh, Carlos Cavallal. And I, I believe Celta really did well in the game against Sevilla. I believe they... They were unlucky not to get that win because they were by far the better team. Yeah, they did. They, they created many good moments against Sevilla. Gabri Vega, you know, he continued his great season he's having. But on the flip side, Sevilla had, and this is something I've noticed Sevilla in every game, even though they're playing badly, they still have one or two chances that they don't put away, and you're left scratching your head as to why they didn't put them away. So, yeah, you have two teams that can be their worst enemy sometimes. <laughs> yeah, the one thing that bothers me about Sevilla is that, first of all, a lot of the players seem to have physical issues. Like, for example, they sign at Mercal, and he has to go through surgery again, so he's out for another three months. And yeah. you, just, you just hope that they can get two proper centre-backs, who are actually centre-backs, and they're not you two. I think they've signed one. Yeah. Like, bad day from... I forgot to understand him. From yeah, it's, it's a weird situation because I think he was owned by Ren. Mm-hmm. Ren loaded him out to Nottingham not Forest. Mm-hmm. And Nottingham Forest, we, <laughs> this is, it's not Spanish football related, but we know that they bought like a gazillion players. And yeah. it's, it's difficult. So he's come to Sevilla. So like hopefully he and Niantu can form a good partnership and can steady the ship. But I, I, I was super positive about them. But at what point do we start to really worry about them that they might not get their shit together before the end? Of, I'm sorry, podcasters, before the end of the season. Yeah. Uh, for Sevilla, honestly, I don't know. They need they need reinforcements. It's up. If they don't get reinforcements and they're stuck with what they have, I think we should honestly talk our relegation. Yeah. Because they have, they can't keep goals out. They can't score goals. They can't control games. They, they can't do anything. Yeah, but but it's hard though. When you have Kamona, you have Salas, and you have Goodell as your centre-backs, like, you're obviously going to be weak defensively. Yeah. That's why they need reinforcements. Otherwise, they're toast. Yeah. They, they really are. And let's, let's look at the table and so we can see how toast they are. Um, obviously, you have Barcelona there at the top. Real Madrid second, and you have that big fight for the top four between third and ninth. And you look at Sevilla there, and it's like you're 18th, 18th after 15 games. That's really shocking. Yeah, honestly, I don't. I mean, they could, they could realistically put together a run. I've seen this before, like a team that's somewhat in relegation trouble when they shouldn't be put together a run, and then they're. Back in upper mid table, maybe they block somehow finish sixth. Yeah. It's possible, and the other teams have shown that they are not consistent enough in getting three points every week. So, yeah, and it's possible, but it depends on them, you know, doing really well and signing some gems in this transfer market. Yeah, this is where Munchy has to earn his bread. Like he's. Like you can say, and everyone can say, oh, it's the greatest sporting director ever. But in the last two years for Sevilla, and then when you look at what happened with Roma, his reputation has taken a big hit. And if he wants to restore his reputation, this is the winter window. This is the window where he... Yeah, and, you know, fighting with your players like Isco isn't going to help too. And But in, in his defense, like Isco is like, I, I could run faster than Isco at this moment. <laughs> 
Um, East School was somewhat decent this season. He's yeah. probably one of their highest cultural contributors. Yeah, but the problem is going back, he like he couldn't run. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, let's talk about other leagues. There's only one like two two top five leagues that are open right now, or three if you count the top six leagues and one of them is the Premier League where Arsenal um they keep on winning, they keep on surprising. And Man City, despite the fact that Holland is setting goal record after goal record, it's, they just can't seem to get wins. And yeah. Liverpool are also in trouble. But I'll start with Liverpool one for Real Madrid. Like they must be licking their lips looking at Liverpool's form. Yeah. Um, I mean, Liverpool might get better when their new signing Gakpo plays, but it's going to, he's going to have to do a lot of heavy lifting if he's to make this team. <laughs> Better because it's really not looking good. They struggled against Leicester. They, you know, lost badly to Brentford this afternoon. Yeah, it's, and you have um, the likes of Luis Diaz out for three months. You have Jota injured for a long time. You know, the defense is just all over the place. Yeah, it's not just Liverpool, though. I, I feel like this is one of those weird years in the Premier League where. Only one team is really serious, and then the rest of them are just falling mm-hmm. apart. Like we spoke about my United's problems, but they're forts. I mean, they're grinding their way up there, but they've been helped by the fact that Tottenham, Chelsea, Liverpool are all having bad seasons and terrible runs of form. Yeah. Newcastle are third, for God's sake. Yeah, so. <laughs> yeah honestly, yeah. In, in football, this just seems like a weird year. It's like we're living in some sort of dystopia. <laughs> Mm-hmm. Yeah, like you think Haaland getting signed by Man City will make them unstoppable, but then they've lost their ability to win games. Like, Man United are two points behind them. Like, Newcastle, like, if Newcastle, like, there was a point where Newcastle were ahead of them because they played more games, but the fact that we're saying Newcastle are second in the league is yeah. crazy. Yeah, and, and it's, the thing is, like, it's not like they've had. But they have 36 points, I believe, Newcastle, after 17 or something games, which it, it's respectable, but it's not... Oh, I'm sorry, 34 points after 30, after 17 games. It's respectable, but it's not outrageous. Yeah, it's not like... It's like they're like 40 points or something after 17 games. Mm-hmm. Yeah, 34 points after that amount of games is really enough to see you beyond 40 place, I guess. Yeah. But yeah, it's 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 crazy and like moving on to like and so before I move on, like do you think Arsenal will have what it takes to complete this job given that they have so, they have a sizable gap right now? Well let's see what happens after they play I, I don't know if they're going to play City anytime soon. But even then, they've done really well in their big game, so you can't count against them. Yeah, it can't really count against them. And let's move on to France because PSG, they, they, they found a way to lose and they lost to Lance and Lance are second. They're four points behind PSG. This, this title race on. <laughs> well, yeah, given that Lance have beaten the team that's directly above them and, you know, just exchange points, it's, I guess, title race on. Okay, well, seriously. Anyway, Neymar conveniently missed another New Year's game and Messi is still on holiday, so yeah. I don't think PSG have too much to worry about over there. No. Even uh, they even struggled to win the other game. Yeah. Their last game against um, tr- um Strasbourg. So yeah, I believe with the full complement they'll be back to, you know, bl- blazing past everyone. Yeah, the thing though with Lance is that it's such an interesting story because I'm not sure if you know this, but at one point Atletico Madrid owned Lance. <laughs> so to see them um, second in the table after being in the second division for so long, and the fact that they have no European football means that we might see them in the Champions League next season. Yeah, that would be great. That would be a super great story. And I think uh, the other team that hadn't lost in a while that lost. This weekend was Benfica. They lost to Braga. And that's relevant because Braga are now further entrenched in the top three. So we might see them as well in the Champions League, which is a team that we don't normally see in the Champions League. And with and any other comments, Oscar? 
I have more to say about Lahaz, but <laughs> uh, I'm tired. I'm tired of talking about him. Oh no! Yeah. Hope, hopefully, he never reps a Barcelona game again. I can't. I can't with this guy anymore. You you do know he's going to rep the Barcelona game, right? Of course, they are going to give this guy a classical. <laughs> <laughs> you know what? You know what? To be fair with Lajos, to go back to him, a lot of times he's not like for some reason. I since that Argentina game or that Argentina game and this game, he was disastrous. A lot of times it's like controlled chaos, mm-hmm. but it's just with the Barca game. It was just like yeah. The thing is that this season is already very chaotic in terms of red cards. Like don't add to it. Yeah. Like I, I feel like I'm disappointed in him because I normally expect better from him if. If this was Pablo Gonzalez Fuertes, I wouldn't even be complaining that much. I'm like, it's what it is. Yeah, or it's our, or other friend, I forget his name. Yeah, even like honestly, two of the usual, two of the better referees, him and Munwera, let yeah. me down this because I'm like, why you're not that se- you're not that sensitive or a referee like yeah. all these other guys. Figueroa Vasquez was the highlight of this week in terms of referee. <laughs> well, actually, actually, no, 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 yeah. Um, he let that journal go not stand. Yeah, but but to be fair, that's that's not on him. That's on the VAR. Like whenever the VAR made like told him he was wrong, he actually made corrections. He actually he actually didn't do too bad. Like he allowed the game was quite entertaining that he mm-hmm. he refereed, which is yeah. fair enough for Figueroa Vasquez. Yeah, I mean that it just shows the frustration. Like <laughs> it's a potential game. It's a game deciding goal. Go and look at the screen. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> but it is what it is. And anyways, as Ernesto Valverde would say, es lo que hay. And for us at La Cancha, Happy New Year to everyone. And hasta luego.